Well, hello there, and welcome back to the podcast that must not be named. I am Melissa. I am Luke. And we are here discussing Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, chapter number 35, Veritaserum. This chapter was 22 pages long and is exactly 3% of the book. Harry, still clutching Cedric's lifeless body, returns to the Hogwarts Quidditch pitch where an uproar is heard when people see the dead student. Harry tells Dumbledore about Voldemort's return. Dumbledore tells Harry to wait for him there as he speaks with Cedric's parents. Professor Moody grabs Harry and leads him to his office. Once there, he begins questioning Harry about what had happened after he touched the cup. Harry tells his story, but Moody only seems interested in finding out if Voldemort forgave the Death Eaters that returned. Harry remembers that there was a Death Eater at Hogwarts, which Moody admits he already knew about because it was him. He explains that he was the one who put Harry's name into the goblet and confused it to make sure he was entered. He told Hagrid to show Harry the dragons. He was the one who showed Harry how to get past the dragons. He influenced Dobby into stealing the gillyweed, and during the third task, used his magical eye to see into the maze. He stunned Floor, Imperius to Crumb to take out Cedric, and made the path easier for Harry to navigate. As Moody was preparing to finish off Harry, the door is blasted open and Moody was knocked unconscious by Professor Dumbledore, who entered the room with McGonagall and Snape. He sends Snape to retrieve Veritas serum and to summon Winky from the kitchens. He tells McGonagall to fetch a black dog from Haggard's cabin and have him wait in his office. He then takes a key ring from the stun Moody and begins opening a trunk in the corner where they find the real Alistair Moody, who had been trapped there all year. The imposter Moody is bound and turns back to a pale young man, who Harry recognizes from the pensive as Barty Crouch Jr. Snape returns with a disheveled Winky, and Dumbledore pours the Veritas serum down Crouch's throat before waking him up for an interrogation. Crouch explains how he was in Azkaban, but his mother convinces his father on her deathbed to release him. So using Polyjuice Potion, he and his mother switch places, and his father kept him imprisoned under the Imperious Curse, with only his friend being Winky, and the only person to learn about his existence was Bertha Jorkins. Barty was allowed to go to the Quidditch World Cup and was starting to break free of the curse. That is where he stole Harry's wand in the top box and used it to produce the Dark Mark, but was quickly put back under the Imperious Curse by his father when he found Winky with Harry's wand. On the information from Bertha, Voldemort located Barty and devised a plan to kidnap Moody to take his place at Hogwarts. Voldemort moved in the Crouches with Wormtail, where he kept Mr. Crouch under the Imperious Curse, and Barty did his best to help Harry win. When Mr. Crouch showed up on the grounds, Crouch Jr. found him first after Harry went to find Dumbledore and killed his father, turning his body into a bone and burying it in a loose soil near Hagrid's hut. While Winky sobbed inconsolably listening to his story, Barty grins insanely after finishing and says that now his master has returned, he himself will be honored beyond all his dreams. Alrighty there, Luke. So let's go ahead and jump right into character introduction. I feel like you have some explaining to do. Yeah, so this was one right before we started. I was like, so I added a character. I hesitated. And you said, no, that's the right choice. So I, I, I felt validated. Um, I, I added Barty Crouch Jr. as a, a character that we've actually met for the first time. We've seen him yeah. in the memory, kind of. We've been spending all year with him, apparently. Um, kind of, but kind this of, is the but first. we didn't know it was him. Yeah. So Barty Crouch Jr. first truly introduced interactions this chapter. Excellent. Good. Good call. Thank you. Good call. Golf claps. Um, we didn't go anywhere new because we have been in the defense against the dark arts teacher office many 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 times pretty much every year maybe not with coral really but not with coral but pretty much since then mm -hmm. any magic vocabulary there was a capitalized proper noun usage of dark order which i had never heard of uh, so i highlighted it because they said you okay. know i'm going to be there to help him you know with the rising of the dark order Maybe that's a term that's going to be used in future. It was certainly the first time it's been used in the in the story. Yes, hand raised. Doesn't that feel a bit Kylo Ren? It it does. It, it does. <laughs> yeah, I I that I I don't even think I caught that. That's interesting. It, it's nope. only because I'm specifically looking for like oh, if it's capitalized, it usually is for a reason. And that right. one was like normally just listening through, I wouldn't have noticed, but yeah, no, it, it stood out. Well, all right. I'll, I'll give it to you. It's weird. Like it's an odd um, choice on her part because let's just call them death eaters, but it's cool. M yeah, maybe, maybe Barty Crouch has, Crouch has his own plan. He's got even grander 
plans. Yes. All right. And then we had an illustration. Yes, we did. And it said illustration is a box, probably a trunk with multiple locks and a variety of keys. And what yes. do keys do? They open um, things. They unlock things. One of my favorite lines for one of the pirate movies. Second pirate movie, actually. One of my favorites. So um, it's a box with keys. Yeah. I think that's, I like this one. I like it. Yeah. There's the I correct think, number, which makes me happy too. Yeah. I had to count <laughs> a couple of times. I was like, I just, I just have to be sure. I will say, I think much like last chapter, it's very difficult to find something to illustrate that doesn't give away the ahas that are coming. Right. Yeah. Because not a, we don't, there's not a lot of action in this particular chapter. So what do you do? So I love the idea of the trunk because it's incredibly significant and means nothing. Yeah. There's no allusion to it ahead of time. You just see this and I have no idea. I like right. that. But then Without looking back, context. you're like, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of tells everything once you know what the context is around it. So exactly. All right, so we're going to jump into our notes here, and I I did something a little different. Typically, we just kind of talk, and you have this, and I have this, and we go through my notes, but I feel like this chapter had three very distinct parts. Mm -hmm. and so instead of saying, hey, your notes and my notes, I'm going to um, say, let's talk about this part, and then we'll just talk. Yeah, okay. and we, you've, you've set it up that way a handful of times, and yeah. it usually makes sense. Like, oh, there are four distinct things yeah. that happen. This one happens to be three. So I'm I'm very much with you on that. So I, I, I've also titled them in kind of fun ways, at least the first one. Um, the first section is called Landing at the Tournament. <laughs> Tournament's Landing. <laughs> oh, oh, never more. Um, so, so what were your overall thoughts on the first, it's three pages long, the first sort of three pages of that chapter? So I, I really like how hectic it is. It's like, oh, and I know we don't talk about the movie, but we're getting to parts where it's, I think the movie does really good jobs on certain things. And like the fanfare, I just, whenever he lands back here, the tournament, I, I still hear, oh, the band playing and people are cheering because it's, oh, it's so exciting. And they're here for this festival, basically this huge, joyous event. They're confused, but oh, now they're back. Like, oh, triumph. Right. And right. then it's kind of like, and we're in, in Harry's perspective and he's, just all out of sorts. And I, I like when he's traveling through the port key and he's like, he's just holding on to the only two things that matter in the world right there. I mean, he is like death grip for really a lack of a better term on Aww. Cedric and on the Triwizard Cup. I didn't even mean that as like a pun. It just, he's it holding just on for, for everything because to him in that moment, that's everything. And then he lands and it says then, a pair of hands seized him roughly and turned him over. Harry, Harry, he tur it turns out to be Dumbledore. And the thing that really stands out to me is like Dumbledore's trying to gauge like what's going on, right? And he sees what's going on and cr <sighs> Fudge walks up and he just immediately says, my God, Diggory, Dumbledore, he's dead. Like he says this out loud. And then the words were repeated. The shadowy figures pressing in on them gasped it to <laughs> gasped it to those around them and then others shouted it screeched it into the night he's dead he's dead cedric diggory dead like come on man like you should have some propriety you should have some sense of maybe don't like shout this out loud especially like did you check his pulse like you don't like come on like if he was around in book two he'd have been like every time one of the kids was petrified oh he's dead he's dead like don't don't start raising that alarm bell immediately and as loud as he did. Right. Like, what? what is it? A sense of um, timing, if yeah. you will? How about using some tact? Like, yeah, some self-restraint. Like, oh, 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 okay. Yeah. And you're the minister for magic? Like, come on. That should be like part of your skill set. Like knowing when to like withhold some information. A leader having some tact and... Um, sense of propriety and a sense of time and place and to the benefit of the people. Yes, I agree. He mm -hmm. should. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. And the other thing that really stands out to me is kind of at the very end of this little portion, 
but like just the fact of Dumbledore having to tell Cedric's parents, like that's another one of those pretty, pretty tough spots. And when, when Harry goes through and tells Dumbledore, you know, he asked me to bring his body back and he's, cause that's again, the only thing on Harry's mind and right. it's just he's back and Cedric's dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. It's, if I had a feel, it would it would probably it would probably touch it right there again when he's like It got mine. Did it? Yeah, the the one. The one. <laughs> yeah, it was like oh, like yeah, it, when Dumbledore's like you can let go. Mhm. You can let go. No, I don't want to let go, Jack. I'll never let go. It was very, I don't know, moving, I guess. And and still chaotic because half the time we don't know who's talking. Yeah, Harry let it's go of him. Like he that heard voice Fudge's voice say, and he felt fingers trying to pry him from Cedric's limp body, but Harry wouldn't let him go. Then Dumbledore's face, which was still blurred and misted, came closer. Harry, you can't help him now. It's over. Let go. He wanted me to bring his body back, Harry muttered. It seemed important to explain this. He wanted me to bring him back to his parents. That's right, Harry. Just let go now. Like, really well done by Dumbledore, I think. Like, because he, he's not going against what Harry's doing. He's trying to help Harry ease back into some form of normality of we have to, I think there's a, a very fine line that Dumbledore is going on. And I think he does it pretty well. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Like Dumbledore is trying to have Harry make the decision to do that. That mm-hmm. is okay. He's doing it in the best interest of Harry, not in the best interest of all the other crazy going on around him. Mm-hmm. It is a Harry's best interest to let him go. It is in Harry's best interest to take a breath. It's in Harry's best interest to stay with Dumbledore. Yeah. To segue into my next one kind f- of a- final, final thing on yeah. that. He also completely validates Harry's effort in that. He says, yeah. yeah, like that's right, Harry. Like he appreciates the, like, he doesn't have the full story or anything, but he is completely with him. He's like, yeah, that was the right thing to do. Now right. we need to. He doesn't, and he doesn't act like, what are you talking? Like he doesn't get yeah. flustered mm-hmm. at this. He stays cool, mean? calm, and collected. Dead Robles boy told you to bring him back. Like, yep, yep I love Dumbledore. Me okay. Too. So Dumbledore and Fudge give conflicting orders, right? So Fudge says Harry should go to the hospital. Dumbledore says Harry should stay. And obviously, like, neither one of them quite get what they want. But I find that really interesting that they're both sitting there sort of, like, Fudge is shouting orders and Dumbledore's like, no, do this. So I think that's interesting that they have um, different ideas of what the next step should be. Oh, yeah. I also find it very interesting um, but just go to the hospital. Shouldn't there be a first aid station? You'd think so, right? Like yeah, Madame Pomfrey, aid. like at hand. They did it in task one. And task two. I mean, right. she was, like, yeah. So I'm thinking like that was a bad choice in general. Somebody should have said, let's send him to Madame Pomfrey. Who's right there? <laughs> yeah. Like there, not way in the castle. Just, just like there. It's cool. So that's something that bothered me. Yeah. In the... It, in what you brought up about the way Dumbledore and Fudge react to it, I, I think there's a lot of information on who they are as people. Um, yes. I won't go into detail or anything, but I, I think it's worth noting that Fudge is very much like, hey, let's separate, isolate, and kind of protect and put it in a way that makes sure you're controlling it what you can as opposed to... Dumbledore, who's doing his best to help the person that he can help right now. So my final thought is about the cup. Mm -hmm. Ready for this? Okay. So generally a port key wants, it's like a one use only, or at least I won't say generally, because I don't know. The original version of port keys that we saw earlier on in the book, it's a one use, right? One way ticket, you arrive. what we've seen, yeah. Mm -hmm. This port key, right? goes back and forth apparently mm-hmm. is it a round trip port key or is it just a continual movement port key like the way it's set up which i asked that to say harry and cedric touched it went to the graveyard harry touched it again and came back what if somebody else picks it up where are they gonna go yeah. or is it done so i'm a little concerned about that one i, I think that's pretty reasonable like i i don't know if it's just on like a loop of uh well it's just gonna keep going back until it's undone like magically undone 
Um, right. And maybe that was one of the first things that happened when Dumbledore kind of sees what's going on and, and the murmuring and Harry can't hear. Maybe he realizes and he's, you know, unport keys it just because he doesn't want people disappearing again. I could easily see that happening for Dumbledore. Just like just a quick side. Yep. Like clearly that was a port key. Something. It shouldn't be. Unport like, um, key it. Or at least I'm going to take all the enchantments off. Maybe I don't right. know a port key or something, but I'm going to remove all the enchantments. Mm-hmm. I can see that. That's standard operating procedure for anti, you know, for defense against dark arts. Right, right. Unenchant things as they come at you in high stress situations. Yep, finite. Yeah. Anything else with the at the tournament talk? Nothing specifically. I thought it was really, really good. Like, again, kind of like last chapter, I think this is also a really, really good chapter. Um, Uh And this is a really, really awesome introduction back to the chaos that's going on. And I I like it. Yeah, I agree. All right. So then part two is what I'm going to call with fake moody. Having a mood. Having a mood. In general, I think Harry's like overall thought process is amazing during this whole like six ish pages. Do you have anything you want to kind of talk about with that with Harry's oh, brain? Yeah, I see you have a little bit more to go on, so I'll I'll knock mine out real quick. And I know you had kind of have a a note on it as well. I really really like Harry's disbelief when when Fake Moody tells him that it was him that it was Moody doing all of these things, putting his name in the cup, putting, making sure that everything was out of the way and making it easy for Harry to get through this whole thing. And he's just, Harry's disbelief is exactly how the reader feels. And he's like, no, you didn't. You didn't do that. You can't have done. <laughs> and Moody's like, oh, I assure you, I did. <laughs> that was me <laughs> the whole time. Yes. And that like, I don't know. There's a line. It's It almost got picked as like one of my favorite lines and I did not, but I'm going to see if I can find it and read it to you. <laughs> Who put your name in the Goblet of Fire under a name of a different school? I did. Who frightened off every person I thought might try to hurt you or prevent you from winning the tournament? I did. Who nudged Hagrid into showing you the dragons? I did. Who helped you see the only way you could beat the dragon? I did. Who told Cedric to open it underwater? I did. And it was like over and over and over again, right? I did this. I did this. I did this. It has a very musical cadence to it, doesn't it? Like that would be really easy to to put in a musical, that series right there. Oh, yeah. It's got a really nice meter to it, you know? I I don't know if it sticks perfectly, but... Uh, there I is. Did. There's like a cane and a top hat. <laughs> I'm picturing, isn't there like a. Well, hold on. Would his a, cane be the peg leg? Maybe. I, I'm picturing the, is it the Lucifer song from Damn Yankees? To me, that is like, if I'm, I'm putting my musicals together, I feel like that's kind of the vibe I'm getting here. Don't know it. I don't know it very well, so I could be wrong. But what somebody I'm remembering in the, somebody I Somebody in the chat will know. Years. Alicia Kingston will know. There you go. Come on, guys. <laughs> All right. I will say, like, it, this is moody talking. In this section, it's it's moody, right? Alastair Moody, the Auror, the famous Auror, who we saw back in the Pensieve, like, has fought Death Eaters, has lost body parts to Death Eaters, right? The shock of it being moody is just astounding to Harry and to us. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, because we don't, we don't know that it's not actually moody until... Dumbledore gets there later on, which we'll get into. But that this whole time, as you're reading it for the first time, there's no indication that it's not still moody. And right. I've, I've talked at length about this on this show and other podcasts that I've been on as well. The the fake the fake out of, of Mad-Eye Moody is so well layered and detailed that even though we know it's it's Barty Crouch Jr. at this point, but like every single thing he's saying still throughout the whole book easily layers with what real moody would do and what with this delusional barty crouch jr character would do like everything aside from oh this chapter right here but like it works so well because there's such extremes about the same thing so like they can say the exact same things and have completely different reasons for saying the same thing. Like, oh, I told you I didn't, you know, the thing I hated most was a Death Eater that walked free. That line is so perfect for both of those characters that it throws you off so much. And then you have this where it just completely throws it right back. of like, wait, what? 
Right. Like Moody, the bad guy. I don't understand. What I are don't you doing? get Yeah. It's so good. I love it. It is so good. And, and he's so good at being Moody. Oh yeah. Well, he's had all year and we'll get into that later, but he's been questioning him, like getting to know him, <laughs> get to know Alistair. Getting to know you. Here's my next musical reference, The King and I. Okay. <laughs> so the one kind of, I, the rest of my notes are all little like nitpicky details, mm-hmm. right? The big overall theme is, I can't believe it's Moody. And it's a being not Moody, but it's so good when it we think it's Moody. Yeah. One thing I noticed, of course, somebody helped Dobby. It's kind of nice to know that because I, at least the first couple times through, never really thought about how did Dobby know about Gillyweed and how did he know that Harry was struggling. Like all of those background things that we complained a lot about in like book one, right? Early on in book one, it was like, oh, this just happened because it works for the plot. Oh, this is one of those things that Dobby giving Harry the Gillyweed way back in task two worked for the plot. But now we have some backstory that helps to prove exactly why Dobby had it at the time he did, rather than just, here, I'm going to randomly help my friend because that's what needs to drive the story. (laughs) Sort of sub, sub, is the word subterfuge? Mm -hmm. Right word? That's the correct word. Behind the scenes, actual plot happening behind the scenes that we don't see on screen. I really like that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I really like the full backstory, the, the two different backstories that we get. It's it's so tidy. Like, I like when it's not just thrown together. And it's like, oh, like, I, I appreciate Sherlock Holmes stories. Like, they're fun. Yes. But then it's always like, oh, and then there was something that you would have no indication about that is really what it is. Like, until it all comes together to the very, very end. This, at least there's crumbs that you can nibble at and then it layers on top of itself as opposed to, oh, and there was a specific type of mud on his shoes that I knew. And that's how I knew. It's like, I, right. I, okay. I, like, but, right. uh, okay. But how about let some of us try and figure it out? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, again, a pretty good kind of detective story that you don't even, it doesn't feel like that. Like you don't realize how much of a mystery is going on until you're like, oh, wait, it was, that was bigger than I thought even. Right. Like we knew something was going on with the name in the goblet, but there was so much other stuff going on that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I like it. I like it. I also like that we finally found out what happened to Fleur and Crumb. Yes. I like that it wasn't just Crumb attacking Fleur. I know that sounds terrible because she got attacked, but I'm really thankful that Moody attacked Crumb. Moody attacked Crumb or attacked Fleur and then imperialized Crumb that Crumb didn't actually, under the curse, mm-hmm. attack Fleur. Mm-hmm. That even when controlled, he didn't do that. So yeah, that was nice. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and my other favorite thing, this, this, is, this might be my favorite thing in the whole section, which is saying something, because I really super like this chapter. Like a lot. Like, put a note in there for me. This might be my favorite chapter. There is a part in this six pages where... Harry is Harry and Moody are talking, fake Moody are talking. Oh, and yeah. Harry's eyes keep flickering to the faux glass in the background. Yep, I'll say it's right before the whole paragraph. That's my favorite line. <laughs> yeah, and it's um the and it, that's actually not the first time it shows up. It yeah, says, it's a, it's kind of flicker. sprinkled in a couple times. Yeah. So at one point there is um, over Moody's wand was still pointing directly at Harry's heart over his shoulder. Foggy shapes were moving in the faux glass on the wall. And then later on the foggy shapes in the faux glass were sharpening had become more distinct. Harry could see the outlines of three people over Moody's shoulder moving closer and closer, but Moody wasn't watching them. His magical eye was upon Harry. Yes. I love that, that these faux glasses are working against Moody. And maybe had been all along because mm-hmm. there was always, like the shapes, but then it was, you know, you don't have to worry about them until you see the whites of their eyes or something like that earlier on. Right. But, but somebody's coming. So the fact that Harry has felt for many, many chapters now, somebody come, somebody come, yeah. somebody come help. Does anybody do anything like, p- please. In the background. So if he's looking here at the person just over the shoulder somebody's coming moody's and normal doesn't... eye was bulging the magical eye fixed upon harry the door was barred and harry knew he would never reach his own wand in time it's it's yeah and here's the thing we don't know if he's come they're coming for harry or they're coming for moody 
but somebody is coming. Yes. And then they come. Heck yeah, they do. And that brings us to section three called Dumbledore Arrives. Yay. All right. So you want to go ahead and start us off here? Yeah. Yeah. So I really like the overall introduction of Dumbledore, Snape, and McGonagall. Really awesome. They just basically stupefy him through the door. Um mm. And it says, stupefy, there was a blinding flash of red light, and with a great splintering and crashing, the door of Moody's office was blasted apart. Moody was thrown backward onto the office floor. Harry, still staring at the place where Moody's face had been, saw Albus Dumbledore, Professor Snape, and Professor McGonagall looking back at him out of the faux glass. He looked around and saw the three of them standing in the doorway, Dumbledore in front, his wand outstretched. What an entrance, right? <sighs> And it kind of culminates even more of the faux glass. Like it confirms of who it, it was because Harry sees them in the faux glass clearly and then turns and sees them actually at the door. Awesome entrance. I mean, it also incredibly effective. So there's that. Good job. Yeah. How about you? Um. So I kind of want to talk about, so Dumbledore comes in, he gauges the scene, looks at Harry, looks at the knocked out fake Moody and turns to his minions, AKA Snape and McGonagall <laughs> and gives very reasonable requests really mm. like um you go get a truth serum and a house elf and you go get a dog yes and i love that in harry's perspective he he says to himself right, in the narrator who i'm assuming is harry at this point um if either stape or mcgonagall found these instructions peculiarly pe peculiar they hid their confusion i just like it's just so like either one they're a really good team and they just kind of go with it figure it out trust Dumbledore go for it or two they like practice this <laughs> like 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 this is part of their like search and rescue like staff <laughs> requirement <laughs> training that they go through um he's training yeah yeah but oh. I, I I just like that Harry notices like okay in any other context that would probably be weird but neither of them thought it was weird and they just did it without a question like that's that's a good team right there yes and I think it brings me back to what happened with Fudge earlier in the chapter. He's like, wait, Cedric's dead? Da -da -da. He's got to do this. The three here, Dumbledore, Snape, and McGonagall, all show that composure of it doesn't matter what I feel and think right now. What matters is taking care of the situation. There is no room to be incredulous. There is no room to be confused. There is no room to question. This is what it is, and we're going to fix it. Yep. So they go off, and um, Dumbledore takes a drop. He takes a what? He takes a drop into a hole. So yeah. he gets, he pickpockets Moody, fake Moody, we, we're soon to find out, and unlocks all of the keys, right? Mm -hmm. We find real Moody in, in 10 feet down in a ditch in the trunk, which is cool. It's very Mary Poppinsy. And it says Dumbledore drops down into the thing and lands on his feet. That's a 10 foot drop. And he's just like, even earlier in this chapter, when it, it specifically said that Dumbledore picked Harry up off the ground with strength way greater than what his frail body would seem. Like, I, I'm not I'm paraphrasing, but like right. that's two pretty athletic feats that this old, old man is is, is doing. Clearly, yeah. probably magically induced in some, some form. He's controlled probably, that stress-driven magic, I think. Uh, well, I was going to say that's probably not, like, allowed during magical sporting events. One would assume that sort of magical enhancement. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Performance enhancing magic. Yes. <laughs> um, so my other, like, I, I just, I have three words. So much backstory. I know. So much backstory. So I just stopped taking notes because it was just, like, I just, there was just backstory and it was so good, but it's backstory. So go for it. Yeah, yeah, and it really is one of those like, hey, if this is your first time reading it and you haven't read the chapter yet, like, go read it. <laughs> like, it's it really kind of Clarissa explains it all, and uh, then this time <laughs> it's it's Barty Crouch Jr. under Truth Serum, um, which is the titular uh, part of this chapter. But um, I really, really like getting Barty Crouch Jr.'s actual backstory. Like, it was cool for Moody fake Moody to give us the how we got to where we are right now, like in the time period of the book that we've read. Like in the year. Right. It pretty much went like, hey, everything that we were worried, like wondering, how did this happen? He basically told us. And I really like that just a couple pages later, we get like the full, okay, well, everything we knew, like, you know, you were in prison and then you, you died. 
we get that whole gap solved as well of basically his mom was dying of heartache and so they did a a person switch and she's the one that died in prison they buried her body he went and lived at home under an invisibility cloak under the imperious curse for years years and years and years and uh, that's we find out that it was barty crouch jr who was the one that well winky convinced Barty Crouch Sr. to let Jr. go to the Quidditch World Cup and take his seat in the top box uh, under the cloak, under the Imperious Curse, but at least get out, get some fresh air. And we found out there was actually him, Barty Crouch Jr., that takes Harry's wand. I mean, Mm -hmm. Harry isn't that, you know, complacent or neglectful that, like, the whole time it was like, oh, maybe it fell out. Like, no, that's not going to fall out of your pocket, bud. Like, no, (laughs) like, something else is going on. Um... And I like that we have that kind of wrapped up. And we also see how much else was going into all of this story that we didn't know on exactly whenever Barty Crouch Sr. figures out who cast the Dark Mark when they were still out in the forest in the woods at the Quidditch World Cup. I think that gives a lot more context as to why he so ruthlessly dismissed Winky at the time because of the danger of Barty Crouch Jr. being there and that getting completely out of hand. Not saying he did a good job at it. Well, we can touch more on that later, but I think it provides more like, okay, there's a, there's a lot more to it than just, Oh, Winky found a wand. And I mean, this ties up all the little loose threads that seemingly were so unrelated Mm -hmm. because the same person was there doing them all the way through. And we didn't even know it was a person. Right. That, that's right. the best part about this is that you didn't even know he was there. Like you didn't even know who this guy was. This was not a name you heard until chapter like 20 or something. It was uh, 30, the pensive. There you go. Chapter 30. Well, maybe it was 20, 29 30. that he was first referenced. Cause I think that's when we were in the cave with uh, Sirius and he talks sure. about his son. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I love the story. I feel like you and I are going to get into a debate between um, how Winky was used by Barty Crutch, but I think that's, we're going to save that for a little bit later. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Bertha Jorkins. Right. Yeah. She was quite the catalyst. Yeah, pretty much. So she, she was a bit more important than we realized. And I'm not really going to go into why because, you know, read the chapter. But like all along, hey, this girl's missing. And, you know, Dumbledore has an opinion of how he remembers her. And Sirius has an opinion. And Ludo Bagman has God knows what. And um, Arthur is bringing it up. And she's actually really important. Her disappearance is massively important yeah. to the plot of the story. And we find out that she found out about Barty Crouch Jr. Uh, at oh. the Crouch's house and approached Senior about it. I'm just going to switch to Junior and Senior at this point. We yeah, know no, who we're talking better. about. Um, I mean, I'm having a bit of an Indiana Jones um, yeah. <laughs> flashback when you do that, but it's fine. So she approaches Senior about it, and he says, nope, going to use a pretty pretty severe memory charm on you, which I think we can pretty conclusively say that's what jumbled parts of her brain up. She wasn't quite the same as she was, which is maybe why she got coerced, whatever, with Wormtail in Albania, like, and was probably lost mm-hmm. ahead of time um, just because the probably the memory charm was uh, pretty intense. Um, yeah, and then she's carrying all of this information that then Voldemort uses, and yeah, it's uh, way. It's one of those really tiny threads that even characters in the story like actively say, like, "Ah, don't worry about it." And it right. was it was a thing. It was a thing. All right, my last teeny tiny thought is, um, Dumbledore is finding out about the Marauders map. That's not going to be good, right? Oh, you know, I, I took Harry's map or Potter's map. Uh, what map? <laughs> well, the map that shows everything in Hogwarts and everybody in it stores information for later. We'll have to ask about that one. <laughs> Hold on, let me make a note. Right, like, <laughs> leave my pop-up sticky note on my screen because that's that's a parking lot thing. I don't need to talk about that right now, <laughs> but I'm gonna need to talk about that at some point. Yeah, we'll come back to it. <laughs> All right. So, Luke, any other big thoughts, or or before we move on to our next section? I don't think so. Let's let's move along. It is time for your five burning questions. Five burning questions. Question number one. What do you think the peppery tasting drink that fake Moody 
gave Harry when they first got to his office. I think it's the pepper up potion that we heard about in book two. I absolutely do too. So I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I was going to ask that question. I was like, oh, okay, here's a good question. And then it said the peppery taste. I'm like, oh, pepper up. Yeah. Potion. And it like, I'm, I'm looking for the line real quick. Um, Moody. Okay. Harry heard the scrape of a key in a lock and felt a cup being pushed into his hands. Drink it. You'll feel better. Come on now, Harry. I need to know what, exactly what happened. Moody helped tip the stuff down Harry's throat. He coughed, a peppery taste burning his throat. Moody's office came into fo sharper focus, and so did Moody himself. So the fact that it, like, instantly, like, refocuses your brain, too. Like, yeah, that's where I was like, yeah, pepper up. I just wanted to see if you would remember that uh, specific. Uh, oh. Or if you had any other ideas, too. But that's oh. that's what I thought it was right away. You're trying to set me up for failure there. <laughs> Too bad for you. Or a I chance for did creativity. It. Too bad you just knew the answer. <laughs> what happened? Question hmm. number two. For a while, Harry is led to believe that the real Moody had been doing all of those terrible things. How would the second half of the chapter have been different if it had actually been the real Moody? Like if this was Alastair Moody the whole time? <laughs> well, the backstory, the backstory would change significantly, right? Yeah, it just would have been like, okay, yeah, he was just like a double agent the whole time, I guess. <laughs> Like, yeah, that's the question, right? When did you turn? Who flipped you? What like, sort of shady deal did you like do with some guy day, in a trench right? coat in the back alley of East Germany? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? I, I like the corrupt cop angle. Like, that would have been, that's that's a different level of story. I, I like this better because it's it's yeah. such a, what? But I think it would have been completely fine. Like, the story all still could have worked out. There have been some questions that could have been answered a little bit differently, like this information. Yes. But if it was still just actually moody, I could still pretty easily get behind it. But, like, then then imagine Dumbledore's reaction. There is a difference between how Dumbledore reacts with it being Barty Crouch Jr. who has snuck out of prison and been imprisoned. Like, you can see him finding a way to be empathetic towards. Not saying he's going to choose a side, but at least find a way to be. But this is his friend. His this peer. For decades. Yeah. Somebody that he legitimately respects. Like, and trusts because he yeah. brought him back for this year alone. Mm -hmm. And then Arthur Weasley, right? He's really good friends with Moody. We learned that early. Like this would have more serious ramifications in the adult world than yes. just Barty Crouch's weirdo son. A, a character that everyone thought was dead. And so is right. it a big deal. Like, it's going to have some effects for Barty, but he's dead already. So throw him back in prison. Like, <laughs> okay. Question three, what do you got? Question number three, what kinds of items do you think were in the first six compartments of the trunk? Well, I definitely think there was a notebook that said like Barty Hart Voldemort. <laughs> the front cover. So there's that one. Um, spiders. Okay. That's all I got. That's all? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not very creative today. I'm sorry. Okay. I've been building furniture. Yeah, I think a lot of time it, it just more like... Um, other dark detectors like these are I, I think legitimately just moody's things like like, like actual moody who had packed it yeah. so like there's one section of his clothes yeah absolutely okay that other other spare legs maybe some fashionable magical eyes <laughs> for the dress up days right yeah i mean for the yule ball and everything he knew what was on the schedule he's a planner True. He, you know, he's not, not at all. all Question right. number four. How did Dumbledore figure out that wasn't Moody? And how much did Dumbledore know before he even questioned Barty Crouch Jr.? Jr. So, so, see, I'm telling you, Sean Connery every time. I, I know Dumbledore says, as soon as he took you away from me, like I knew that wasn't Moody, but there had to be something else. Right? Not just, oh, Moody is doing this and he's not listening. Therefore, he must be an imposter. Like, do you think, like, like, what are the pieces he put together before he even walked in the room? There's no way he would have already, um, like, gotten all the details, but maybe, like, maybe he knew that Moody put the Goblet of Fire in there. And here there's this port key coming back. I know Moody was the last one to see it before it was in there. Now Moody's taking this kid away from me. What else? Yeah, I mean, I think it was very clear that he knew that Moody was an imposter as soon as he took him away um, from where Dumbledore said for him to be. Because you know Moody was likely, that character, Junior, would have been close enough 
that he would have heard Dumbledore's order or his, you know, uh-huh. statement for Harry to stay right there. And real Moody never would have done that. And I think that's definitely the number one thing. If he would have, we, we've seen Albus do some incredible quick thinking, cool, calm and collected. That's, that's his MO, right? And, uh, like if he quickly kind of goes through all the information that he has at hand, he's not going to figure everything out. But I think he's got some pretty decent ideas of like the big question for him, I think, with no information, what happened to Barty Crouch Sr.? Like that's a big like on on Dumbledore's land, like on in his area. Like that doesn't happen. Like on his list of to do things. That's like right up at number one. Yeah. And I don't think Barney he Crouch? quickly forgot about that in the last month. And so... I'm not going to say that he knew that it was Junior, but I don't think he was surprised. It was more of the, let's figure out how. It's not it's not who, it's how. Mm, that's true. Pull out your book two reference. Again, yeah, right? Right? It's amazing how much book two applies. It it, it really does. Look back. It really I don't does. Think I don't think hate that book. People hate on book two. It is very I know. important. We hate it on book two. We, we were people. I like book two. Now. Anyway, moving on. Question number five. Question number five. Do you feel differently about Crouch Sr. for when he dismissed Winky? As in, like, do I like him more or like him less or just like him different? Just do you dislike him differently? Do you like him? Do you feel anything different knowing the context of what actually happened with Winky and Barty Crouch Jr.? I dislike him greatly. I feel like he has made major life errors. One, obviously he was not a very good dad. So that, but we knew that. that. That's not different, right? I really question like he and his wife's relationship mm-hmm. and the fact that he allowed her to convince him to let the son out. That leads me to believe the wife probably thought, oh, my son's innocent and he's sick and we, I'm dying anyway. But like, no way, dude. Your, your son's a bad guy. A bad apple. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like, I really and, question her, but like, it, it's one thing to love yeah. your kids. Like, I don't know. Maybe she was at the trial. Maybe she, yeah, but she wasn't acting like he was guilty like the other ones were. He was putting on a good front. Remember? I know. That's what I'm saying. That. She was at the trial and she could very likely have believed that he didn't really do anything because he was so adamant about it. And that's her baby, you know, screaming like, you know, they're not listening to me, like do something. And she couldn't do anything. But she probably harbored that that feeling of maybe he didn't do anything. And so that was which easier really, to justify for her. Which really enables the son's behavior. If you are screwing up, if you are not making good choices, I don't care how much you love your kid. Or Sorry, if your kid is screwing up and your kid is making terrible life choices. They're making as thumbs adults, down decisions. <laughs> like, I love you, but it is not my job to rescue you. And I think that was her mistake. And it was Senior's mistake for allowing her to do that. But I think a bigger mistake is honestly Senior's orders to Winky. That is a big job. A f- it, it's more than full time. It's more than parenting because at least in 18 years, you're out, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's something like that, at least like the day to day stuff. It's just like an impertuity. Like we're just going to keep him alive at home forever. And that's your job. Yeah. I think I think that's my biggest takeaway and 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 change in feeling toward not really change but more like intensified feelings towards Crouch Senior is that how dare you put that much on Winky? And yeah, maybe Winky should maybe he shouldn't have let Winky talk him into letting Junior go to the World Cup, but she should never have been put in that position in the first place. That's your responsibility. Yours. That's all. Yeah, no, I I really completely agree with you for the most part. And I I was just curious if knowing like in the heat of that moment when Barty Crouch Sr. finds Junior under the invisibility cloak, finds Winky there with the wand, like in his head, he knows all of the stuff that we just learned. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at this like, wow, Winky, you messed up bad. Like it's not it's not so much that he thought Winky cast the dark mark. He knows the full background of right. You like this was your responsibility to do this. You talked me into doing this. I didn't want any part of this. And look how badly this backfired. Like, this is huge. This is a big, big deal. And I don't know. I just, in the heat of that moment, 
I am not surprised that he dismissed her outright w- the way he did. Like that that's really what I want to get to. Is that does it seem any different with that or is it you just still I think that's still worse because she made one big mistake, but it's one mistake in a decade a decade or more of work. Uh, there was also the really big one that Bertha Jorkins found out about him no, because of her. Fault. Eh, kinda no, was. Fault. Kinda How was that Wiki's fault? She's the one that let Bertha Jorkins in the house. No. Yeah. No. Barty Crouch Jr. was back in back in the back of the house. I'm really not hating on it. I'm not trying to hate on Winky. I'm more, I think, the full context of it uh, okay. changes a little bit. Yeah, I don't think so. I still think, like, Winky's his best ally in this. Well, yeah, but he could also get... Let go of her wisdom. He could have gotten three or four more house elves, too, that have to be sworn to secrecy. We see how effective that is. Well, he should have gotten multiple house elves early on and like a a team effort, if you will. Yeah. Either way, good topic for discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Harumph, harumph, harumph. (laughs) Yes. Bad parenting. And that brings us to our chapter superlatives. Luke, what was your favorite line? Oh, I kind of referenced it earlier. It's about a paragraph, and it comes right after Dumbledore enters the room and attacked and stupefied uh, Barty Crouch Jr. It says, at that moment, Harry fully understood, understood for the first time why people said Dumbledore was the only wizard Voldemort had ever feared. The look upon Dumbledore's face as he stared down at the unconscious form of Mad-Eye Moody, was more terrible than Harry could ever have imagined. There was there was no benign smile upon Dumbledore's face, no twinkle in the eyes behind the spectacles. There was cold fury in every line of the ancient face. A sense of power radiated from Dumbledore as though he were giving off burning heat. I love it. It's just so like visceral. Like You can just feel that fury and i love that it's just kind of like this monster for good unleashed like i just the 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 power radiating off him and gandalf throwing off the gray cloak and the white ah, i am gandalf the white yeah it's Mm -hmm. and it's it's so good both times that gandalf does that with theoden and with saruman like it's so good both times and it's very much like that like yeah okay it's a pretty package, but there's a monster in there. Like, like that's some power. I, I just find the way it's described really, really easily visualized. And I like that Harry gets to see maybe this more raw form of power. And it kind of makes more sense to him. So really, really strong paragraph there. So I have a favorite line. And it is Voldemort. Or not Voldemort. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> Professor Voldemort. All right, regroup. Sorry. You're okay. Take a deep <laughs> breath. And it's Voldemort. Oh, it's not. <laughs> it's a totally it's like. Can you imagine if Voldemort was the professor and and Dumbledore was like the evil one? Okay. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> My brain went down like a whole rabbit hole. I'm back. Hi. It's Dumbledore talking, and McGonagall was like, "Harry, go hospital wing," and he's like, "No," and she's like, "But he." He's had, and Dumbledore says, he will stay Minerva because he needs to understand. Understanding is the first step to acceptance, and only with acceptance can there be recovery. He needs to know who has put him through the ordeal he has suffered tonight and why. I think that is so wise of Dumbledore because so often adults try to swoop in and clean up or or whisk away all the bad from kids, and, and you lose the learning opportunities. You mm-hmm. lose chance to figure out what's going on because a kid's brain is not as fully developed as an adult. And we as adults have a hard time understanding this. Why would we whisk this kid away when he's just trying to form and understand this? He needs to be there. That's all. I really appreciate that Dumbledore backs up Harry and is like, he needs to know. And here's why he needs to know. He has to be able to get better from this. And he will only get better if he gets every detail. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of giving potentially a little bit more information than, than a lack of information. I would rather explain myself with severe details. So everybody knows exactly where I'm coming from than just sort of whisk it away. I yep. have lots of arguments in my house because not everybody here thinks that way, but that <laughs> is my own personal like way of exploring the world. Yeah. I will say I also highlighted that line and then I saw that you had it. So I didn't reference it earlier, but that's another one of those 
Dumbledorean quotes that like <laughs> can pretty easily you can you can relate to that. Like at least I can. And um yeah. it, it just always has stuck with me. It's I think words to live by and right along with that sense of development that this child needs to have is mm -hmm. it's different when you're feeling all these super strong emotions and what is going on that Harry is doing it and having the opportunity to try to work through it at that point. Because Dumbledore has assessed that Harry's not overwhelmed, right? He doesn't, He Harry's not having an anxiety attack where it's kind of like shutdown mode and he's not going to receive any information. So he's, right. he's assessed that and he's finding this to be maybe an emotional growth opportunity for Harry as well of, okay, you're proving right now that you can handle what's going on. So let's go through all of this and kind of right. aid more maturing in learning this learning opportunity. So I think, I think I'm incredibly with you and uh, it's a really, really good line. All right. Who was your chapter MVP? I really think it's Dumbledore. I, I really, really do. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say Dumbledore because he's, he's the man, right? I mean, he's, He's the bomb, as as AK in the chat says, Dumbledore the wise. Truth. Very true. And how about your honorable mention? Well, technically, I wrote it first, but I will give it to you because you're the one who gets to pick. Um, it, it's got to be Dumbledore, yeah. right? The calm, cool, collected, powerful, understanding the development of Harry, the way he stays so calm when questioning Barty Jr., I can just picture if McGonagall was doing it, man, she would be flying off the handle. She'd be so mad. That rage would be coming through. She is a bit more emotionally driven, but in a usually a really well-directed way. Yeah, I, 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 uh, McGonagall is my spirit animal. So <laughs> she's your Patronus. I, 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 yeah, like I get it. But I just, he ruled this chapter, except mm -hmm. for those pages when Harry left him. And he came back with a bang. Like, that's mine. You L left with Harry. Literally came back with a bang. <laughs> literally a bang. <laughs> Knocked the door off the hinges. Bang, bang, bang on the door. And that takes us out for the night. We are out of here. So you should follow us on social media because we actually were 20 minutes ahead of time for our live streaming and everybody who follows us on Twitter and Instagram got that message. No typos so, this time. No, no time turners, no typos. <laughs> I had a very like on target appropriate picture that matched topic. And it you, went to the were correct smart. account. It, we were doing, <laughs> you're doing great. Ab, you're doing, you're great. doing great, Melissa. You're doing great yeah. girl. <laughs> It's great, but you should follow us and you can find us at not named podcast on all of those places. You can also send us all of your digital owls, questions, comments to an email of not named podcast at gmail.com. Check out this show and all of our shows at the podcast that.com where you can find every episode of every show we've ever produced. You can find our fabulous um, blog, which our guest writer Gretchen um, also of MuggleNet fame comes in and does a blog for us most months she does it for all of our shows so check it out she is spot on with some of her writing and she is amazing so just follow her everywhere anyway yep you can follow her on all the socials at Gretchen Sketcha Subscribe, like, rate, and leave comments on iTunes and YouTube. Again, we are live streaming these recordings. Thank you in the chat for being with us. AK, Gertie, go home. Appreciate you guys being here. Um, so do that thing. Make sure you hit that notification bell. So the, if you don't see the tweet that goes out, you get a little a little notification from your YouTube app on your phone or your, your PC that, hey, they're doing it. And you should join us because oh. it's a lot of fun. And this show and all the shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. We are, again, going to be updating our reward tiers here very shortly in about three weeks. And so stay tuned to check that out. And you can learn more about all of that at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. We truly, truly appreciate it and love you. Join us next week when we have our five chap recap. Stay imaginary. Thanks.
Hi, chat. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Uh, you're doing great. <laughs> Thanks, Ab. You're doing great, Ab. I, I would like everybody to know I'm sporting one of my Abbey shirts today. That's an Abbey shirt? Abbey shirt. It's it's an Abbey Universal Studios shirt. It even has like the logo on the back. Nice. I'm going to try and turn around. I don't really know if it'll show up for you. It's something, it's something on the back there. Yep, it's up top. It's up top. Okay. Podcast.com. See? That's pretty cool. Nice. Very, very cool. All yep. right. I think that's it. I think that's it. Bye. Bye.